So I'm here with Alex Lehman and Mark Duplass. Uh, Mark is the executive producer of Asperger's RS, and Alex is the director of it. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining me. Dude, thanks for having us. Yeah. Big fan of you. Thank you. So tell me how you guys heard about this comedy troupe. Um, there, was, uh, there was this really great article about them that uh, stood out to me when I was, I was actually doing a little research about Asperger's and it blew my mind because it, it destroyed all the, the preconceptions I had and I thought I find these guys very interesting, it would be cool to make a little documentary about them, I need to make sure that they're actually funny because otherwise it's just you know like a, a pity piece or something, I wanted to make sure that this was very interesting. So I uh, looked them up on YouTube and I found their sketches to be hilarious to me, absurd. I knew that some people wouldn't get it, but to me it was like, you know, it was my kind of thing. I mean, you know, how would you describe their comedy? It's extremely dry. It is hard to tell if they're trying to be funny sometimes. It is deadpan. It's punny. Um, and a lot like your humor, sometimes I don't know if it's real or they're joking. That's true, but theirs is actually <laughs> yeah, funny though there's, sometimes. There's a yes. successful. Yeah. Yes. My, mine is, yes, it's hard to discern whether I'm joking or not, but the only thing that's guaranteed is the laughs will not happen. Yeah, so I, so I realized the guys are really funny, and, um, and they were very interesting to me, so I, I, I went out there and started filming them just to kind of see what their process was like. That's great. And we hit the ground running. It's interesting that you said you don't know if they're trying to be funny sometimes, because that's what people say to me a mm -hmm. lot. And I think that might be an Asperger's thing, like that deadpan. Mm -hmm. thing. I think it might be. I mean, if for me, part of the draw to this material initially was, you know, I came to it through Alex because we had been friends and we had been sort of working together on the league for a long time. and. And I didn't really know a lot about sort of like the Aspie community and 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 I was like I was like, Oh, I gotta watch this guy's documentary. I hope it doesn't suck. It's probably gonna be terrible and I'm gonna have to tell him that I liked it and lie to him, but then I was pleasantly surprised by it. Um and and you know, the the more and more I get to know the guys, I, I guess like I'm sort of struck by this really fun thing that they like to talk about, which is like, are we becoming successful because people feel sorry for us and they want to uh, throw some support our way? Or are we found legitimately funny? Um, and I think that's super fascinating. And, and also, you know, like one thing I'm noticing is like, they, um, for better or for worse, are starting to become uh, targeted as leaders, as, as people who can inspire other people who are on the spectrum to come forward to follow their dreams. And they are sometimes like, oh, that's cool, that's great. Sometimes they lean into right. it and sometimes they pull back and they're like, we don't wanna be known as funny in spite of the fact that we have Asperger's or, right. you know, and I don't know, I guess the more I hang out with them, I'm like, I think I'm starting to realize that part of what makes them so unique and special in their deadpan way is I think they're funny because of rather than in spite of in a lot of ways. Sure, sure. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing that you brought up. Um, one thing that really struck me watching the movie was just the number of people that, uh, you know, just that, it's a double-edged sword, I would say, you know, where you, you know, the reason that maybe that they're, getting a lot of attention at mm -hmm. first is because of the Asperger's. And I mean, it is in their name, right? So uh, that's one thing, but but then they wanna sort of rise above being labeled as that and just be comedians. And like, yeah. that just seems like very difficult. It is, I, you can tell that the guys struggle with like, you know, are we being uh, valued for our own merit or are we being valued because, you know, we're on the spectrum and what does that mean? I mean, you know, it's, far be it for me to be able to decide like what the right call is but I know I always have certain standards for my work where like if I'm putting out a movie and I'm like how do I get people to come see that movie right so sometimes I put things that are ostentatious in the trailer and attention getting and things that just get them in there and I'll do that if I believe I can deliver and that the movie will ultimately be rewarding you know and one of the main reasons I was able to come on board this documentary, besides being friends with Alex and wanting to support him and wanting to support what is obviously a great cause, was like, at the end of the day, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think 
whatever we are doing to get people to come see the troop, it's it kind of doesn't matter because when they get in there, they the guys deliver. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we sort of argue about sometimes in a good, healthy way um, is like how much of this is about them being the best comedians they can be and, and getting their careers going forward and their own personal dreams versus maybe subordinating that a little bit and becoming a little bit of the teachers and the mentors that the community is kind of begging them to become. When, when you see these guys, these shows, when you see parents of uh, kids who are on the spectrum show up and they're so moved by them and they, they want them to sort of for lack of a better word, be these sort of like Norma Ray leadership figures um, and how the guys at times recoil from that, but then sometimes think, well, maybe we should do this. How much of this is about me and my dreams versus doing things? And I mean, look, that's where you should be in your 20s. It's all good, good stuff. And I don't have the answers to that, but it's really interesting to watch them go through that. The struggle, yeah, the struggle for them is, is legitimate, but something that they've learned is even if they're getting attention uh, because of the name and, and because of uh, the, the autism label, as soon as people show up, it's on them to prove whether or not they're funny. So they're being given an opportunity that a lot of, a lot of performers don't get, and they're not taking that for granted, which I think sure. is, is really important, but they, they definitely go out of their way, even in their material, to, yeah. to point out that they don't want pity and you know, that they don't want to be... Um, in some ways, they don't want to be the, the face of autism. Yeah, I mean, one thing, you, you'd probably be able to tell this, us this more because you're just such a member of the community. Is like, I'm so struck by how emotionally aware the guys are at times when they're like, okay, we have a conflict here where we're late. And, you know, as Aspies, like being late really stresses us out. We have a conflict where we're in an overstimulating environment with noise and crowds, and that really stresses us out, and we have to get ready for the show. It's not like they get crumbled by that and they're not aware of it. They know what's happening. They still try to maintain it and work through it. And I wonder, are, are most people like on the spectrum or in your community, do you find they have that level of awareness and are working with those skills? Or are they more like just like, man, I'm just getting crushed by this and they don't know really why? Well, uh, I think there's both. Yeah. I certainly myself am incredibly self-aware and I think that's one of the reasons I do what I do and, yeah. and one of the reasons I can speak you know to you know large groups of people about my experiences and actually re relate that to parents yeah. who are worried about their kids or worried about wh where their kids are going to go and a lot of Aspies are very self-aware yeah. because they've been incredibly introspective their entire life yeah. and and they've been forced to do that because when you grow up getting bullied all the time and not being able to make friends you have to sort of learn how to act like a neurotypical person mm. or act and so you realize what you're doing and a lot of times it can drive you crazy if you know you're not <laughs> careful but yeah. it definitely that's definitely a there's a performative element yes to a for sure degree. exactly yeah. that's why I think the comedy thing is so cool and I think there are probably a lot of comedians who aren't diagnosed but actually right. do have uh, Asperger's or are autistic or on yeah. the spectrum in some way there's also uh, a very Socratic way that they think about things. At least, you know, in in hindsight, I think sometimes I've you know I see them getting overwhelmed by you know whatever stimulus or their emotions, and then in hindsight they are able to reinterpret what happened and be more way, way more aware than than most people as to what happened and why it happened because they take that that very analytical approach to understanding it all. So I don't know if it's like, you know, sometimes in the moment there's less awareness when they're overloaded by stimulus, but... Uh. Yeah, it's, at least for me, it's a lot more of thinking about it after the fact. While it's happening, it's hard to yeah. do both. It's hard to actually act and do it and then like actually be aware of it as well. It's, yeah. If that makes sense. You know, we haven't talked about this a lot, but I mean, you know, Alex and I are like in continued contact with the guys and, and are kind of like you know, following them and what they're up to now. And what's been really interesting is like, I'm no stranger to like, I guess either producing or like mentoring young filmmakers. And a lot of times what happens is you very quickly realize some of them are, you know, can be led to water and you walk away and they can do it. And some of them really just can't, you know? And what I'm struck by when I watch the guys, is like what a natural fit it is for them to be workhorses um, because they, 
for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's an Aspie thing or just who they are, but they're like, they love the structure. When we can give them a structured environment, say like, this is something you guys can do and we'll support you in this. I mean, I don't see anybody work as hard as they do, you know? Um, so it's been really kind of great to see how much they stick when you like offer just a little bit. They're just right. like so ready. It's a lot of that is, is the focus, I would assume. Well, yeah, it's, it's funny that you say that because that's actually one of the uh, symptoms is, is this ability to focus on something mm. intently. And a lot of times it causes you to really uh, do so at the detriment of other things in your life. Like I for me, with puzzles. Yeah. <laughs> like when I start <laughs> well, yeah. a thousand piece puzzle, it's over. Yeah. I don't hear anybody. I'm in. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, well, if you really want to fuck with, you know, an autistic person, give them a puzzle with pieces missing. Oh. Yes. Well, you know what? That's what we yeah. all want to do. We all want to fuck with autistic yeah. people. It's really, that's why we got together to make yeah. this film in the first place. It was, uh, um, hatching yeah. the grand scene. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I kind of want to just get, uh, you know, a lot of people hear about autism in different ways and they're, they're introduced to the community in totally different ways. What, for you, what was your entry point into autism? How did you first hear of autism? And I mean, I'm sure it was much longer before you know you started working on this film yeah I mean for me the stuff I was hearing about was a lot of the Temple Grandin stuff that I heard about when, like when I was younger but it was far away from me and all the stuff that touched me was like my nephew's cousin works with a guy like there was never anything that was close to me for whatever reason I grew up in New Orleans and I grew up in the 70s and 80s when I guess you know the diagnosis was not as obvious back then um, and then one of my friends in Austin had a younger brother who was, who was diagnosed with Asperger's. I guess this was sometime in the 90s. Um, and I got to spend a little bit of time and kind of like sense. And I felt something in the way that he was looking at, at me and the way it was described to me. And I was like, oh, okay, this I have seen before. I've never known what to call this. And I have a very like... It was it was it was very interesting to me because I remember thinking, like, it's somewhat of a relief, and it and it takes a lot of the stress out of how I used to deal with some of those people that I just assumed was extreme social anxiety or something like that. And I was like, okay, now I know this has somewhat of a label to it. We can work within the system and find a way to make this comfortable. So that was like my first step of just like, ah. Okay, this doesn't actually just have to be a socially awkward thing. I know that this is like the way this person's brain works, yeah. and we can now work within this framework and have a relationship, and it's going to be. And you don't take it personally. Yeah, you know, it's they're they're not looking me in the eye, or they're yeah. not shaking my hand, but it's not because they don't like me. Yeah, it's it, or, yeah. or I can't trust them. It's, yeah, this is how they are. Yeah. Um, and you? I mean, it's funny because we we never talked about it, but there was that moment for me as well, the aha, like looking back in my past, like now I know certain people that I didn't quite understand now that I know more about Asperger's I go like oh yeah like I think he probably was he an Aspie yeah. she might have been an Aspie um, so so there's definitely that effect I saw the movie Adam in was it 2009 yeah, it was around. yeah uh, that was maybe the first time I'd heard the term Asperger's like I knew what autism was but right. that yeah so I was pretty late to the game and that movie uh, definitely had a profound influence on me I, I was much more on the lookout and uh, trying to be aware of Asperger's but even when I started making this doc I realized how little I knew and that was a big driving force as to why I wanted to make it you know I mean there was a lot to be learned how long did it take you to make this film I uh, started shooting it in 2013 um, for a summer and then kind of sat on it for a little bit because I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. And then I started editing it in 2014 whenever uh, I wasn't working as a paid cameraman. So it was a nice slow burn. And then, uh, yeah, I guess it was, uh, I don't know, I guess three, about three years all in all. It took a year and a half for me to shoot the epilogue. I, I knew I wanted to kind of give them a little space for a while. But uh, it's been sure. about three years. Yeah. So, and, and the reason I asked that is I was wondering known them for a few years now and they must have at least grown as performers and as people I mean, they've grown in every way part of it is because you know when I met them three of them were 20 years old which to me is a kid I know they don't want me to call them boys or kids but like yeah. you know that's that's so close to being a high schooler yeah. 
Um, and actually, funny enough, when we, when we premiered the film at uh, South by Southwest, I was really worried about you know, getting, like, helping them get on the right plane and like, getting them picked up and making sure they were super comfortable and just wanting to take good care of them. And I think part of that coddling was just respecting talent, you know, sure. whether, whether it was an actor in, in your movie or it's you know, these documentary subjects you want to take care of these guys. Um, but in the experiences I've had with them in the last you know, year, I realized they're so self-sufficient. Like I'm done coddling them. Like, we're about to go to New York, and I, I was like, "Guys, buy your bus tickets, and uh, you know we're trying to save some money. So figure I, it out. Yeah, figure it out. <laughs> Find somewhere to stay. I'll reimburse you for everything, and uh, I'll give you a time and an address, and we'll meet there in New York City. Which, by the way, I will probably have more anxiety in Manhattan than they will. Like at this point, I realized like these guys are so self-sufficient and know how to use the subways and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, to me, I, I think they've grown. But I think also a lot of it is my, my perception of them has changed as I've, you know, gotten to see. Well, you know. I mean, I can see it because you, you guys have a real bond. Like, they trust you now. And, like, look, you know, your, your relative social anxiety, uh, dry, deadpan humor, <laughs> like, <laughs> we you're, can relate. you're, like, you're, you're getting close there uh, in a lot of ways. Totally agree. We took a map of your brain. I'm not sure what's going on. You know what? And, I, and I've asked them a few times. I'm like, but don't, don't you feel like we relate on these things? Yeah. But they don't think I'm funny. So yeah. there's that. So, like, <laughs> so immediately that's there. discounted. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. you know, they still don't, they discount my anxiety. They, to, to them, they... You don't they, get to be a part of the club. Yeah, no, I don't. You I don't want to be an honorary Aspie? I don't, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is a shame. I, and I at least wish I had the focus and, and, and yeah. intelligence that you know they have. So. Do they let you be an honorary Aspie? Not even close. No, they like to make fun of me. Um, we do <laughs> phone calls. They call me an asshole. Um, <laughs> it's very sweet and very endearing. I know they um, like to publicly correct you a lot. They love to publicly correct. <laughs> I was me. I was reading Twitter this morning. And they, I think they they were offended by your use of the term improv troupe to. to they anytime I send a tweet, they're gonna find something yeah. to be offended by, <laughs> and they will correct it. But I love the guys. I think we sent them like um, we sent them a contract for one of the projects we were working on together, and we're like, "Hey, do you guys have any comments on this or anything?" And it came back, and it was like, "Yes, this should be a semicolon." <laughs> and I was like, "These sons yeah. of bitches! They know it's funny. Yeah, they absolutely. know what they're doing to oh, us." Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Which is, I don't think I realized just how much they're skilled at for people who are supposed to be super focused and taking things literally, they're able to take very serious situations and questions and just make a complete deadpan joke about it. Yeah. And I realized like off the cuff too. Like yeah. I mean it's fast. I'm like I'm way more serious than these. Like how are these yeah. guys like, you know, just able to constantly diffuse with, with comedy. They seem so relaxed. I there's I don't know. I, I wish I could learn a couple of those tricks from them. Yeah, and I, one thing that at least for me I totally related to was, and I forget who said it, but uh, one of the guys in the documentary, he was talking about growing up and not being able to make friends, and the only way he was able to actually make friends and not get bullied was by using humor, and that he yeah. cultivated that because it's, it's just out of necessity. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really good connector, for sure. I could have had some friends too, yeah. if only. If only, <laughs> yeah. So, did, so, you, did you use comedy to make friends in high school? Um, I'm going to say something kind of controversial. I think a lot of people, when they talk about their past, they talk about like what dorks and nerds they were and didn't get along with. Like, I was really I was cool kind of popular. Yeah. I was kind of cool and popular yeah. in high school. Then late, Well, actually, like more like middle school. And then like later, as I like started to become an artist and, and like realized, like, oh, I'm an anxious, depressive person. I don't really fit in here. Then it got a little weird for me. You're, you're saying you realized that it was not good for you as an artist to be popular, so you made sure to no, stop being no, popular. No, no, no. I stopped being popular on purpose. Because, no, no, it just that's my to dry me. sense of humor. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there it is. See, I still, still don't understand. <laughs> Three years later. Yeah, it's interesting because the, the, when I was in high school and in middle school, I was absolutely miserable. I got bullied all mm. the time. I went home crying every day. I didn't have anyone to sit with at lunch. I the only person that would sit with me at lunch was the guidance counselor. <laughs> And, uh, but in high school, I, I got involved in doing theater and, and acting in like, you know, drama. And I found that, and I don't know if it just said the people who were involved in that were more accepting of people mm. who were different, but at least for me, I then finally felt like 
there was somewhere where you I was accepted in. and actually had people that thought I was cool and wanted to hang out with me yeah. outside of school and just didn't just put up with me, you know, while I was there. Yeah. So. I mean, there might be something similar to what the what the boys are finding with the troop. Yeah. You know, obviously there's a little bit of that strength in numbers thing for sure. Where I feel that whenever I'm like making music or, you know, making movies, you want to tribe up with people that feel like you, cushions your fall if you fail, you know. Um, and it, it does speak, I think, to that that performative element you're talking about. I mean, it's weird when you were talking about how you feel like, you know, it makes people feel more at ease if you can learn how to perform more like a neurotypical in certain situations. Yeah. I can, I deeply connect to that as a person who knows how to walk into a room, take the temperature of the room, and while I'm not dealing with something as like vastly challenging as like behaving like my brain works a different way, I know how to shape shift in a different room in order to win in that room. And I think a lot of people know how to do that kind of thing, which is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a little bit more outspoken and confident because this is a loud dinner party and if I don't do it, I'm gonna drown. Or like, yeah. this is a really quiet group of people, so I'm gonna lay back and be thoughtful and introspective. And you know, it's, it's yeah. interesting. I've seen the boys be able to do that even in situations where we went to South by Southwest and did press. And I was like, what is this gonna be like for them? Are they gonna be totally overwhelmed by it? You know, are they gonna you know, be interested in staying on point for an interview and things like that, you know? And, it almost seemed oddly natural with like very little coaching how they knew like oh this is a sit down two person interview so we're going to be more like this oh this is the four of us in front of a big crowd so we need to know more put on the show yeah. yeah it's like it's just like comes like that the performers yeah. I mean at the end of the day yeah, yeah. That's, that's something you guys have in common yeah yeah hello my baby hello my baby <laughs> So, and this is a really great thread of conversation, but I kind of wanted just to move on to another uh, topic that was interesting to me. I just, I know you mentioned that you watched it because you guys worked together on the league. Um, what about the film for you, Mark, was so powerful that you wanted to support it and become a part of it? Yeah, I mean, for me, there were a couple of things that, you know, I felt like, needed to be there if I was going to get involved. One, I felt like the filmmaking and the storytelling had to be good. Um, obviously, I knew the subject matter was incredibly interesting and I think important. And Alex had already told me like that you know the community would like really be interested in a piece like this. But I needed the filmmaking to be really, really good. And I really wanted to feel like whether everybody else found the guys funny, whether, like whether I liked them and whether I thought it was funny and it was something that I wanted to support that was like important for me because I felt like it would just be disingenuous to be doing all this work if like I was just like mm, cute little guys with aspies and uh, just let's, uh, let's throw them a bone and help them out you know and, and I just like they have a lot of integrity with what they do and they work their asses off and I just I really identify with them and the way that they approach things they basically just scrap everything together themselves with no money they rehearse in the middle of the street sometimes because they can't find a rehearsal space and they people aren't booking them so they will rent out a theater and do it themselves and that's just how I came up and I really like for lack of a better word that DIY approach of no one is going to help me unless I do this myself it speaks to me to my core because it's just how I've always done my stuff sure what do you hope people get out of this film I mean the most important thing is that they're entertained because at the end of the day it's a documentary about comedians doing their thing. So I, I hope people watch this and laugh and are entertained. But beyond that, the, the, the last line in the doc um, where Noah's quoting uh, Stephen Shore, I want to say, it's how uh, you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Right, Stephen Shore does say that a lot. I'm not sure if he's the original. Okay, well, I think he gives Stephen credit yeah, for it in the in, in the doc, but everyone does. Yeah, gotcha. Well, I think that's an important message, and as far as the the larger you know audience, you know, a lot of people that don't have as much an understanding of the the community, I think that if they can take that as a as the biggest takeaway, it's you know it's going to open up some more acceptance and 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 patience with the community. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's interesting, and I, I think I'm 
just starting to realize this now talking about it, it like I give a lot of speeches about how I came from nowhere as a filmmaker and I had no connections and I worked really hard and I built myself up and that is sort of become an inspiring thing to other young filmmakers who are you know like how am I going to get there who am I and I feel like hopeless um, and they see a path of how to do that and I think I'm realizing that like I think I want that feeling for like Aspie kids who might be thinking like oh my god look at these guys they feel like me and I saw exactly what they did they started a troupe out of nothing out of their garage out of their basement and all of a sudden now they're 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 out playing shows and they're and they're touring and it's working and that is an inspirational thing like I know it's a lofty goal but that honestly is like the most exciting element of it and the guys will fight me to the death on it and they will say we don't want that we just want to be a funny troupe and I will say great but there's a bigger play here yes. and I, I just I will I will continue to fight that battle because I believe in it do they have shows coming up yeah they're they're opening up for Emo Phillips in a couple of weeks in Massachusetts which is pretty exciting and they've got he's like one of their heroes yeah he's one yeah. of their heroes for sure so they're yeah they're, they're getting to open for for their hero and then um, yeah, they've they've gotten representation recently, and I think they're booking some shows for early January in Massachusetts. But uh, I think they know the specifics on it. But I know, yeah, they're booking some stuff. I really enjoyed their show at the Meltdown. Mm -hmm. It was really funny, and I thought the audience there was really getting a lot of their humor. Um, but what it made me wonder is when they play different places, mm -hmm. is they're a different reaction because I feel like people at the Melta have like more of a sophisticated sense mm. of humor and are actually able to understand like some of their stuff, which is really funny. But yeah, I feel like a lot of it's not for everyone. Yeah, yeah, they have a they have a niche, and uh, certain audiences are going to be more responsive. And they and they bomb just yeah. like everybody else does. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, no audiences, no two audiences are alike, and that's for yeah. For, for all performance. Yeah. yeah. What do you hope happens for them? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm kind of getting sick of them, honestly. I hope they disband and, you know, <laughs> yeah, find, exactly. find better better things to do with their time. No, I mean, we, we want, I think we want them to succeed. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, rooting for them almost as hard as anyone. I don't know. They've got a few super fans, but... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see them find the balance of what is going to be personally rewarding for them which is uh, to succeed as a comedy troupe find a ways that I ideally they can be you know economically supporting themselves on this because as an indie filmmaker I, you know I know that you can be doing really well but still not supporting yourself so that would be right. like a huge step but also blending that with you know again some of the things that I think the community wants from them you know Noah used to teach at a camp and that's where he met the guys and that camp is no longer and like who who would be in a better position to restart that or get something like that going again and and you know again to to keep inspiring kids in the community and and seeing these parents show up to these shows who are so inspired by what their kids can be like i'd i'd like to see that become a bigger part of their lives too great um when does the documentary come out it comes out uh november 11th in, uh, in theaters and on iTunes on the 15th, yeah, in, uh, in LA, November 18th, and it'll be out on Netflix in December. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you guys like to add? I think we've covered a lot. Goodbye yeah, forever? Good. Yeah. Yeah, to quote the doc. If you don't know what that quote means, it means you haven't watched you the movie watch, yet. Watch the movie. Watch the movie, and then you'll know what it means. Goodbye forever. But the movie's not out yet, so. <sighs> Shoot. Yeah. Uh, but wait a minute, somebody might be watching this after November 15th. Mm. It's possible. Can that? Oh yeah, I guess that would could happen. It's a little time travel -y, but yeah. it's possible. So we're speaking to people in the future. Yeah, it's from the past. Yeah, all right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, and thank you for everything you've done. As I told Thanks you, so much. Uh, Noah, Noah and the guys are big fans of yours, and you've had a thank profound so influence on them when they were kids and teenagers, so... What you do means a lot to all of us. Thank you, dude.